Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Braden Knutson. I'll be your host for this webinar today. Um, we'd like to ask everyone if you wouldn't mind answering a couple of polls for us down here at the bottom about um, how you heard about today's webinar and where you're listening from. We've also got a few announcements to go through. We will have our next webinar um, tomorrow, Friday, January 20th at 4 p.m. Standard Time, and that will also be by Catherine Grant, so she'll be kind of come back for us again tomorrow. We'd like to invite everyone to come and join us for that webinar as well. Um, also, Roots Tech is coming up at the beginning of February. Um, that'll be February 8th through the 11th. And if you have not yet registered and you are planning on going to that event, um, there's a link to the registration on our BYU Family History Library main webpage. Um, that'll be in Salt Lake City at the Salt Lake Palace Convention Center. Um, we'll be there if you want to come and visit us and say hi and see the faces behind the webinar program and get to know a little bit more. Um, it's a great event and it's a lot of fun. So today we'll be pleased to hear from Catherine Grant who will be giving a presentation titled Getting the Most from the Search Function on Family Search. After years on the sidelines, Catherine started her family history and discovered a new passion. Her specialty is mentoring new families and helping them find success, maybe even and maybe even Catherine teaches family history classes at the BYU Family History Library and Riverton Family Search Library. She has also written a series for the Nauvoo Times on family history. She currently works for the LDS Church as a technical writer and business analyst. When she's not doing family history, she also enjoys good books, uplifting music, and fresh raspberries. So we'll turn the time over to Catherine now, and as um, she's getting her presentation all loaded up, we'll remind everybody that there is a comments and insights box in the top right if you want to comment on anything during the presentation. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to write those in as well on the bottom right-hand side of the box here. Great. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. It's so good to have you with us. And today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the search function on Family Search. I think that might be one of the least appreciated or understood uh, functionalities on the website, and there's so much to it that I think will help you in your family history research. So let's go ahead and dive in and look at what we're going to be covering today. When you sign on to Family Search, you see this menu at the top, and we're going to be talking about all the items that are under this search menu. And you'll see six of them. There are records, which refer to historical records such as birth, marriage, death, census, things like that. You see an option for Family Tree that allows you to search the, ch the shared tree on the website. You'll see an option for genealogies, which leads to genealogies that were submitted by individual users. You see an option to search the Family Search catalog, and this was formerly known as the Family History Library, or FHL catalog. You'll also see a, an option to search Family History books, and finally, the wonderful research wiki. So we're going to talk about each of those six options in a little more detail. But before we do that, I wanted to comment on two things that you will see on four of the search options. And they're the ones that are circled here. So the things we're going to talk about, you'll see on historical records, family tree, genealogies, and the family search catalog. I'm using the Search Historical Records screen as an example, but again, these apply to all four of those screens. So you notice when you sign on to Historical Records, this search form is pretty simple. You've got a, a first name, last name, and birth information. But there are a lot more fields on this screen, and the reason Family Search doesn't show them is because it would be very, I think it would be overwhelming to sign on and see, you know, a search screen with 40 fields or something on it. So they show you the most important ones and the ones that you're most likely to use. So in historical records, it's going to be the name and the birth information. But suppose that I wanted to search for a marriage. Well, it's really easy. You just click the marriage button here and it drops down these marriage fields where you can enter your marriage place and your marriage date range. If you decide you don't want to use a field, you just click the button again or the link again and it makes the field hide. So that any of these blue underlined fields, you can click the, or excuse me, blue underlined links, you can click to display fields for that option. 
option and then click them again to hide the fields. So that's a nice option. It gives you a little more flexibility in your search. And then the other thing that almost nobody knows about because it's not labeled are these exact checkboxes. And you might have seen those on the screen and wondered what on earth they were. Well, basically, the way they function, Family Search by default conducts fuzzy searches except on the dates. So for instance, in that first name field, if I were to type the name Elizabeth, the historical record search will also bring back names like Bessie, Betsy, Lizzie, Liz, uh, Elizabeth spelled with a Z and with an S, so forth. Most of the time, that's what we want because, as you know, uh, spelling in old records is not always standard. But there's times when we want an exact spelling. So we want E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H, Elizabeth with a Z, and nothing else. If you want that, then you would click this checkbox next to the first name, and it would only return Elizabeth with a Z in your search result and none of those other options. So wherever you see that, that checkbox next to a field, you can click it for an exact search. And again, that works on these four options. OK, let's dive into historical records. Now, if any of you have done indexing, you've contributed to the historical records on this site. So thank you. This shows you just how important indexing is and what a great help it is to make those records available for free to the world. So I'm guessing that most of you have probably conducted a simple search on this site with an ancestor's name and birth information. So we're going to talk about all three. There's actually three options on this page, and we're going to talk about those. But first of all, here's a little overview. Sometimes we, we bat these terms around historical records or family tree, and we don't know exactly what that means or what the records are in them. So historical records are records chiefly about deceased people. And they're kept mainly by churches and governments. So as we mentioned before, that includes your census records. It includes your church records for baptisms, marriages, and burials. It includes your government records for birth, marriages, and deaths. It can include military records, emigration records, things like that. Basically, they're records that contain information that tell about certain events in a deceased person's life. So on this site, there are actually three different ways to search for these historical records. The first one is, again, probably the one that most of you have used, and that's just doing a basic name and event search. But there's also research by location and finding a specific collection. So let's look at each of those. First, search historical records. Because I bet that most of you are familiar with at least basic searches on this, I wanted to talk about a couple of more, not really advanced searches, but maybe you'd call them more creative or more focused searches that you can do in search historical records. So the first one that I wanted to talk about is searching for a specific marriage, although these principles apply to other searches as well. I've heard some people say that the best way to get the results you want on a search is to fill in as much information as possible. But I've also heard people say the opposite, that the best way to get the information you want is to fill in as few fields as possible. Actually, both of those uh, pieces of advice are a little bit off the mark. What you want to do when you're searching for a record is you want to complete the information that is most likely to be on the record. Does that make sense? So for instance, if you're searching for a marriage, marriage records typically do not contain death information. <laughs> I've never seen a marriage in a record with death information. They also typically don't include uh, children even if the couple has children by previous marriages. That's just marriage records just don't list deaths. They don't list kids. So for, for you to specify that information when searching for a marriage is, is not going to help. And it may actually interfere with family search finding the record you're looking for. So on this marriage record, usually what you find on a marriage is at least the bride and groom, the marriage place, and the marriage date. So those are things that you want to fill in for sure. And then depending on 
depending on the locality, for instance, in England, the father's name will often be listed after, say, the 1700s. So if I think the father's name is going to be on the record, or if there's a chance, I might put the father's name on too. But I want to focus, again, on the information that's most likely to be on that record that I'm looking for. So I click search and lo and behold the record that I wanted comes up at the top in the search results and then of course I would click if I click the name it pops down a brief description if I click details it actually goes to a page with more details and this little icon here the camera indicates that there's an image available up here unfortunately for my ancestor there's no image but there's a couple of others down here that have images so that's an example of a focus search for a marriage record. Let's look at another very useful search in Family Search Historical Records, and that is how to find all children of a couple. So what you want to do when you're, do, you're looking for all the children of a couple is you specify the last name but no first name because of course the children are going to have mostly different names unless, yeah I realize there's exceptions to that for instance in England a lot of times they would name another child after a child who died but the, the point is that there will often be you know, almost always there's going to be a broad range of names and so you don't want to fill anything in in that first name field. But you put in the last name and you put in the birthplace where the couple lived that you want to find the records and then also a birth range. And a lot of times that will, if they lived in the same place, that birth range will run from the time of the marriage until the time that probably the woman's childbearing years ended. Then you go ahead and fill in the uh, names of the parents because those often will be on a christening or a birth record. And then you click search. And here, all with just one search, I've come up with a number of children for my ancestors, Henry and Sarah Bescoby. So that's a great way to find a lot of children at once so that you can build a complete picture of that family. Okay, let's look at the research by location feature. And this is one that is so useful and I, I think a lot of times we don't use it because we're so used to just using the main search over here. But this actually will lead to a, a page that is focused on the location you pick. So here I am going to hover over the map and as you hover you notice that the location turns uh, orange or yellow. And so whatever's highlighted, that's the location that you're going to get when you click. So I'm going to click here and it's going to bring me a pop-up that shows me all the jurisdictions that are part of that highlighted location. So in my particular case, I want to choose England, but I could have picked any of these other options. So when I click England, I'm brought to this wonderful page with a lot of resources for English research. So it's got the normal uh, search form where you can search by name and birthplace and so forth, but look at what else it's got. It's got, yeah, it's got the search form. Sorry, forgot to bring up the little highlight there. It's also got uh, links to the Learning Center. So it features a couple of uh, records or a couple of learning lessons that you might want to look at. Uh, of course, it doesn't have room for all 24 of them, and so if you click this link right here, it will take you to the Learning Center and give you a list of all the courses on English research, and all of these are free, and they're wonderful. You can also view the catalog for England here. Basically what this does is just bring up the catalog with English filtering on it, so you go straight to English records with having, without having to sort through any of the other records. You also have a link to the wiki. If you click this link, it will take you straight to the English research page in the wiki, which also leads you to other pages in the wiki. And then, this is also one of the best kept secrets and something that I just love. If you scroll down the page, you're going to see digitized images which have not been indexed yet. So you notice they say image only. And so these are records that are in the queue, so to speak, to be indexed, but they have not been indexed yet. So we'll talk a little bit later about how to browse through those records. We'll have an example. So let's look at now find a collection. This is useful if you know the name of the collection or all are part of it or if you want to find collections about a certain location 
and you, for instance, all records about Durham. So if you know all or part of a collection name, you can type it in here. And as you type, the matches show up below, so it, it couldn't be easier. So in this case, I'm searching for Durham in England, and I'm going to click on the one that I want. If the records have been indexed, it brings up just your standard search form. So you can perform your search from there. However, if the records have not been indexed, you'll see something like this. It will have a link to browsing images. Now, when I used to see that, I would run the other direction. I thought to myself, are you kidding me? Uh, 106,000 images? I'm not going to talk about needle in a haystack. I'm, oh, that's just not worth my time, and I would run away from the page. Then I attended a, a a presentation by Robert Kerr and realized how wrong my thinking was about that. Let me show you why. So when you click that link, let me pop back a minute, when you click this browse through X number of images, you get to a page with what they call waypoints. And basically the word is just what it sounds like, it's things that point the way. So in this case, it uh, creates links to, the, or provides links to the the logical divisions in this collection. So this particular collection has records for Cumberland, Durham, Northumberland, and Yorkshire. And I don't know why they divided York and Yorkshire, but they did. So, um, so if you click any of these waypoints, then you drill down to additional waypoints. So I click Durham, and I got all the parishes in Durham. And then I click the name of my parish, and I get year ranges. So do you see how my running the other direction was completely not necessary? Because I look at this, and I say, OK, this is manageable. I can drill down to what I want to see, and so I'm going to click the years that I, I'm looking, I'm, I know my record is in that year range, and then finally I've got to the digitized image. And this again is actually really easy to navigate. You can either click these arrows right here to just page through it, or if you're looking, you know, you might look at this and say, okay, these are in this, the 1837, but I know I want 1840. So you click in this box up here and put maybe OK, we've got 169 pages, so I'm guessing oh, page 100. So I type page 100 in here, press Enter, and it pops me immediately to page 100. And so it's very easy for me to focus in on the time period that I want and find the record that I want. And one other wonderful thing on here, you might be saying, well, how do I attach that to Family Tree because I didn't search for an indexed record? As a kind of temporary measure, Family Search has made it possible for you to attach this image. So you just click Attach to Family Tree and then attach it as you usually do in the, in, in, as a source. And then I'm not sure what will happen when they finally index the records, if those will be converted or not. But at least in the meantime, you can go ahead and attach this image straight to your person in Family Tree so that it can be a source. And speaking of Family Tree, let's talk about searching Family Tree. So when you are on here, this is the second option, of course, and this searches family tree, which is the shared tree or the pedigree that, that you know, the worldwide pedigree that they're building, that we are building on FamilySearch.org. So when you click that option, let me pop back here, when you click this family tree option, what it does is actually take you over to the find screen on family tree. So it's exactly the same. You're no longer here in search, but you're over here in family tree, and it's exactly the same as if you'd started here and clicked the find option. So uh, the most often we'll search by probably name and birth information. That's a great way to bring up people's information. And uh, when I did this, I wanted to comment. I assume that most of you are familiar with doing this kind of simple search. So I wanted to comment a little bit more on the results. This results page has some useful features. They have, they put the best matches at the top and they appear under a blue banner that says these results strongly match your search terms. So you'll notice that every item that comes up, every person that comes up, it lists their unique ID and then it gives them a rating. And they're, 
I, I call them stars. I, that's what I hear people call them, though they don't look like stars. But it just sounded funny to say a four bubble rating or a five bubble rating. So I'm going to call them stars. But you notice here, this is a very, very strong match because it's got four or five bubbles. This is not quite as strong, but still pretty good with four bubbles. Then it also, because you don't necessarily just want to see best matches, it shows you you know, three star and lower matches under the yellow banner. And sure, they don't exactly match your search terms, but so many times I find that those are relatives. Or sometimes they actually are my person and the record either had a misspelling or they moved and it was a different location or anything like that. So while these blue ones are definitely worth your attention, a lot of times the ones under the yellow banner are also very much worth your attention because you may just find a nugget of gold under there. And then on the side, you'll notice that your search terms appear over here. If you need to refine them, you can do so. For instance, suppose that I decided, oh, I, I, I want to change this now so I'm not searching in Lincoln, but I'm searching in Boston instead. And so you just edit that and then, sorry, it didn't fit on the screen, but at the bottom of this gray panel, there's an update button. And you just click that and it reruns your search, populates the search terms over here into your search results, or the search results excuse me, into the main body of the page. So that's what you do when you want to search by name, vital information, or relationships, as we saw on that first screen. You can also search by the ID number, or what is often called the PID, person ID. In order to do that, you click that tab, the person ID tab, and then you put in the ID number. So this is useful, for instance, if you keep a research log and you note your ID numbers on the research log and you say, oh, I just quickly want to get back to that person, just type or copy, the, if your research log is electronic, type or copy the number in here and just click find. And in this case, as you might imagine, it only brings up a five-star match because you searched for a specific person. So it doesn't have to guess at other possible matches. It knows exactly who you're talking about. OK, let's move on to the next one and talk about searching genealogies. What are genealogies? This is the screen that you get when you click that option in Family, family Search. Genealogies are trees or pedigrees contributed by users or created by community projects. So in a way, they're similar to Family Tree, but there are some very important differences. Family Tree, of course, is the common tree that we're all working on and that anybody can edit, add sources to. The goal of Family Tree is to create one correct record about everybody who's ever lived on the earth. Genealogies, on the other hand, are multiple separate genealogies created by these users or community projects. The caveat about genealogies are, the caveats I should say, are as follows. These are not verified by Family Search. Of course, Family Tree isn't either. But sometimes people think because these genealogies are listed that these are some kind of, um, what would you say, official record by Family Search of genealogies. And that's actually not the case. Family Search make the, makes these available to us as a courtesy and as a research, research tool. But Family Search, I mean, there's no way that they would have the means or the time to go in and verify all these records that's left up to us as individual users as well it should be. So these are not verified, so you use them at your own risk. And they cannot be edited. So family tree, you can make changes if you find a mistake. Not so in genealogies. If you're not the contributor, you just simply can't edit it. If you are the contributor, you still can't edit it, but you can upload a fresh copy. So that's kind of the way that you correct mistakes, is you upload a new copy. And it actually, as I understand it, doesn't erase your old copy. So you end up with an old copy that's not correct and a new copy that is. So basically, this the um, I kind of like to look at this as Ross Dress for Less, and sorry, I, the, the women probably will get that immediately. Not sure if the guys will. Not sure how much you guys shop at Ross. But um, for those of you who don't shop there, 
Ross Dress for Less has some really good deals, but the trouble is you have to sift through a lot of junk to get to it. So in a way, genealogies is the same. There's a lot of stuff that hasn't been verified or that is flat out incorrect, but at least it's there. At least we can search for it. And there are some real gems that you will find in genealogies. So just go in with that caveat, knowing that there's going to be a lot of stuff that may not be trustworthy, but you may find something that will really help you in your research. So they vary, just to sum up what I said, it varies widely in completeness and accuracy, and it may give clues for further research. Let me show you one of the most useful things that I've found in searching genealogies. So I'm going to search for my ancestor, Francis Bescoby, and he has been, his wife is Winifred, he has been researched up the wazoo. I mean, he's got probably, I don't know, 200 duplicates. He had 200 duplicates in New Family Surge. They've all been merged and so forth. But he had a lot of people researching him uh, in the early days of the church and at the time when people were supposed to submit their four-generation project. So he shows up in Ancestral File, Pedigree Resource File, and the IGI. As you see over here, these descriptions about what's included in genealogy. He's in all of these. So when I want to find maybe more information about who submitted it and um, any other stuff I can find out about this guy, this is a good place to come back because People who submitted to these uh, files often had information that we don't have today. So I go ahead and fill in this information and then click search, which was not on the screen. But I get a whole list of matches. And again, these are individual genealogies or trees that people submitted to uh, various either uh, ancestral file, pedigree resource file, or different predecessors of family tree. So clicking on the name lets me see the information for that person. I see a tree representation. But the most useful thing to me has been this information over on the side. You notice that we've got an original patron submission film. Those films also are all over the ballpark. I've looked at a number of those. Some of them are just the family group sheet that the person used to submit ordinances. Sometimes they are temple records. They're just the, a record right out of the recorder's book. Sometimes they actually list the person who submitted the information. And there was one time that I found a name in Family Tree that I did. it was just by itself, not linked to anybody, had no good information. But it was here in the IGI. And so I found the film number, looked it up, and found out that this lady was the aunt of somebody that I knew, which let me know exactly how she fit into the family tree. And I was able to link her up. So that's a little nugget there that um, doesn't always pan out. But when it pans out, you can find something really valuable there. OK, let's talk about searching the Family Search catalog. So this used to be called the Family History Library Catalog. And if you're searching on Ancestry, you'll still see it re referred to by that name. There will be times that you'll see a record there, and it will say FHL film number. And that is the Family Search Catalog film number. So what do you have in the Family Search Catalog? You have items, and I use that term on purpose because there are so many different kinds of things. So you have items held by FamilySearch.org, the Family History Library in Salt Lake, and selected Family Search centers throughout the world. It includes books, both digital and physical, microfilm, microfiche, and lately it's also started including links to uh, digital records that are in historical records, which can be very useful. So most of these items, I shouldn't say most, many of these items can be loaned to your local family history center. So let's look at searching the catalog. Example number one, suppose that I wanted to search for, uh, I wanted to bring up resources that excuse me, talk about Boston, Lincolnshire, England. The thing, I do not know why they did this. And this always throws me a little bit. And um, it just takes some getting used to. You notice that when I put in the place name here, 
the results come up backwards. They come up uh, with the largest locality first going down to the smallest locality. So that's just something to be aware of. If you glanced at this first, you might be saying, Boston, I don't see Boston, nothing came up. But you want to be looking on the right-hand edge because, again, it's largest locality to smallest locality. So you type in your search term and you look and see which one you want and you click the one you want. What you get is a list of categories. So notice, and all related to Boston. So notice we've got one resource that is a biography of something to do with Boston. We've got buildings, cemeteries, church records. Most of the time I end up using the church records. Don't use the censuses too often because they're all digitized now and it's just a lot easier that way. But many church records are not. Uh, digitized yet and so sometimes the only way you can see an original image is to come here and find the microfilm. So when I click church records what it does is drop down right on the screen, couldn't be more convenient, drops down a list of all the resources that are about Boston, Lincolnshire, England church records. So I look through those and I find the one that I want. When I click on the detail for that, it takes me to a screen that has more detail. And so I can see if that's really the one I want. If the record is in FamilySearch historical records digitized, there will be some red text here and it will say something along the lines of click here to view the digitized images. And it's always wonderful when you find that. And just the other day I was working with somebody and came to a, I'd already looked on FamilySearch historical records and did not find what I was looking for. Then I came here, so I was looking thinking I'd find the microfilm, but I came here and found that it had a link to the digitized records. And so if you don't find what you're looking here, looking for on FamilySearch historical records, even if you don't think or want to look at the microfilm, look in the catalog anyway and see if it's got a link to those digitized records. Also, I apologize off the screen here, it was lower down. There's a drop down that says, you can kind of see the top of it here, it says location. And you can and see a drop down that tells you where that microfilm is located. Actually, you know what? I have to back step on that. I'm not sure that the drop down is right under location. But look on if you look on this screen, there will be a drop down that tells you all the family history locations, all the family history centers, family search libraries, or whatever that have that microfilm. And so that makes it easy easy to know. Okay, if I live in you know Riverton and this film is available at Riverton, I can just pop over there and see the see the film without even having to order it. Okay, search the catalog example number two. Sometimes you are looking for uh, all information about a certain surname. So in this case, I'm looking for the Weston surname, but I want to limit it to Ohio. And you might be asking yourself, well, if you wanted to limit it to Ohio, then why didn't you put Ohio in the place name? Very good question. The reason is that if I had put Ohio in the place name, it would only return records that were in Ohio. So if there was an Ohio State Census or if there were Ohio County records or something like that. But suppose that a, a descendant of the Weston family lived in California and published a book about his family there. So if I limited my search to Ohio, it wouldn't pick up that family history that was published in a different place. So in this case, what I found more effective is to put the place in the keyword. And so that will bring back any book about, or excuse me, any resource about Weston, the Weston surname that has a mention of the word Ohio in it. And so we, oh, and you know what I just noticed? This is what I was talking about. So search these family history centers. If on the detail screen that we just looked at a moment ago, I don't think this is the exact label, but it'll be something along these lines. And when you click it, you'll see a list of where that film is in uh, which family history center has that film. So back to the surname search. We're going to go ahead and click on this search and all these results came up. And so all of these will mention both the Weston surname and the location of Ohio. So that's example number two. 
Example number three, suppose that, and this is my favorite thing, if I'm on Ancestry and I find a record that says, sorry, no image, text only, but it has a film number, then I come over here and I search for the film number to see if I can easily get that film. So I pop the film number over here into the fish film fiche number field. And then I also, because I, in this instance, want to go to the Riverton Family Search Library, I select that from the drop-down list, and then I click Search. And it's there. Now, if it hadn't been at Riverton, it would have said no results found because I limited my search to Riverton. You can do the same thing with the BYU Library, with the Salt Lake Library, with any. I've seen it for London. I've seen it for Preston, England. I've seen it for uh, San Diego, California. So you can limit your search for a film to whatever family search library or location you want. And then if it's there, it will come up. And if it's not, it will say no results found. Okay, let's go to Family History Books. Family History Books, this is a wonderful example of how FamilySearch has been reaching out to form partnerships with different institutions. So the Family History Books that you'll find here are all digitized. There's about 200,000 of them. Isn't that amazing? And they are, they use the word books, but they're not all necessarily hardbound books. They're, or they weren't originally hardbound books. You've got different publications, you know, family histories, magazines, and so forth. This is just a huge, a plethora of information from partner institutions, and most of these are libraries. They'll be public libraries or they'll be um, university libraries, that kind of thing, but institutions who have family history books and have been willing to make them available to patrons on FamilySearch.org. So the search that you have on this first page is extremely simple. It's a full text search. So it searches not only the title, but it will search the whole body of the work. So I'm putting in my surname of Bescaby here, and I'm just going to click search. And because that's a pretty unusual name, I didn't get a whole lot of hits. I got 14. But all of these will mention the, the name Bescaby in them. And so what if I wanted to do an advanced search? Well, then actually, let me go back. You see right here, you would click this advanced search button. And when you do that, you get to this uh, slightly more advanced search. It's not. There's not a huge lot of options, but it's got more flexibility than you might think. So in my family, my Bescobies and my Stuffins intermarried like crazy. There, we, we have a bunch of um, Bescoby and Stuffins marriages. So looking in these family history books, I decide that I want to search for either of them. I want Bescoby or Stuffins. Down here, I've got my option to limit it to either books or periodicals or whatever. Just click the drop down to see the options. I've limited it to books. You've also got a language search um, function here. And so if the, the book has or the resource has been uh, released in other languages, suppose that you're researching in French Canada, then you can limit your search to records that are in the French language. So I go ahead and fill out my search parameters, and I click Search. And look at this time, I came back with fewer results because I had more limits on my searches. So, But each one of these records, they're going to be a book, and they're going to contain the name either Bescoby or Stuffins, and they can be in any language. So that's how you do the advanced search. If you want to get back to Simple Search, you just click Simple Search here. When you click a search result, the digitized book comes up in PDF format. Unfortunately, uh, right now, and this, um, this may change in the future, but as it stands right now, you don't see the hits. You know how a lot of times if you search for a certain name, then when you bring it up, you will automatically see the records that match that. In this one, you don't. So what you'll do is you'll get this screen, and actually this part comes up when you click this um, magnifying glass. So when you open, when you click this, you're just going to see this search bar up here, and you'll see the beginning of the, the book. So you click the magnifying glass, put in the search term, I'm looking for Bescoby here, and then you click your Next button to find the next instance of that name. And then it pops you over to the match for that. And you can just cycle through all the matches that it finds in this book. 
Let's talk now about the wonderful research wiki. This, I think, is one of the most valuable things on FamilySearch.org and possibly one of the least appreciated, although I'm seeing it get a lot more uh, traction and visibility just because it is such a marvelous tool. So when you sign on to the Research Wiki, first of all, let's be clear about what the Research Wiki is. This is not a place to find ancestors. Rather, this is a resource of, under, of over 84,000 pages on a variety of different research topics. You can search the Research Wiki from the home page. So most of the time, you're going to want to search for either a place or some research Thing, like you could search for research log or indexing. So again, you're not searching for names here, but you're searching for either localities or something to do with research. So in this example, I am going to, oh, excuse me, I wanted to say, not only can you search by a place or a topic here, but you can also use this wonderful map over here. You can click any of these localities and it will bring you to the main research page for that locality, which in turn has links that go to other localities. So you, there are two great ways to search. But not only that, what I love is that you can search from any page on the wiki. So on this previous page, suppose that I had clicked Europe, or rather, actually, that wouldn't have worked. Suppose that I have had typed in England over here, and then I had clicked search, or clicked go. I would have come to this page, but then suppose I got everything from this page and I wanted to conduct a search again. Well, I could have gone back to Wiki Home, but you don't have to. The link, the excuse me, the search field is right here in the upper right hand corner. So in this case, I wanted to search for a tool that I absolutely love, which is the Latin genealogical word list. That's really useful if you are looking, you know, reading old wills in Latin or so forth. It gives you a list with translations of the most common Latin words. Not only that, I just discovered this a couple of weeks ago, and this is so exciting, so I'll tell you about it in case it's useful to you, because you can't search for it at this point and find it. At least I haven't been able to. But if you search for Latin and you find this Latin genealogical word list, if you click that, there will be a link up here that goes to all word lists. Click that link and you will see a list of everything from Afrikaans to Nederlands to French to Spanish to um, very unusual languages that we as English speakers might not be that familiar with. But if your ancestors from there, that's extremely valuable. So you'll see this whole page of language lists that give you translations for commonly used genealogical terms in those languages. So again, the way you get there is by going to the Latin genealogical word list, opening that up, then it's going to have a breadcrumb at the top. And one of the breadcrumb items is going to be genealogical word lists or something very similar to that. You click it and you see all the word lists in the wiki. So the point I wanted to illustrate here is that when you start typing, the matches pop up. They actually used to pop up on the home page, and they don't anymore, and I'm not sure why. But they do pop up in this little search field on the right-hand side of the page. So you'll always get your match here, and then you just click whatever one looks like what you're looking for. So that concludes our webinar today on searching in Family Search. We've talked about the six options under search, which are records, family tree, genealogy, catalogs, books, and wiki. So thank you so much for your time and your attention today. And Braden, do we have any questions? Um, at this point, there aren't any questions. But um, if you do have any questions, please type those in now, and we can go back over um, those questions as we go through this. Just in closing, um, oh, sorry, let me go back. Somebody was typing into the comments. Um, just in closing, um, we would like to just add a little teaser trailer. Um, next month, at the end of the month, Catherine will be doing a question and answer session on the family tree. So just kind of um, keep your eye out for that. And if you have any questions, look for the, uh, um, the link to enter in those questions. It'll be coming up shortly here. Um, also, <clears throat> um,
get a chance to fill out our polls at the beginning of the webinar, please take some time to do that now. And if you have any feedback for today's webinar, let us know um, how we can make it better and um, how we can improve our webinar series in general. If you have not yet signed up for our email list to receive the updates for our upcoming webinars, which include um, schedules, announcements, um, and other general information, you can click on the link here at the, the center of the page, and um, that'll take you to the webinar website where you can sign up to the email list. It'll have all of the previous recordings for the webinars, and, as well as the schedules. Um, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you next time. Okay, I'm seeing that we have one question from Kay, and she asks, if I, will I find the same info on the four search options on the right of the person screen? So I think you're talking about the, the logos, are you, Kay, on the right side of the person page? And those will actually, if I'm understanding your question, okay, you said yes. So actually, that's a really great question. What that functionality does, so imagine with me, everybody, that you're on the person page in Family Tree, and in that right-hand column, there is a, a box that has four logos. You're going to see the family, or, yeah, the family search logo, an ancestry logo, uh, I believe is it Find My Past, I'm going from memory here, and My Heritage. The ones I use most often are the top two. So if you click that family search logo, it's going to actually take the information on the person page and use that as search parameters. So And then it's going to search the whatever you clicked on. So if you searched Family Search, it's going to take the information from the person page, like the name, the birth date, the parents, the children, whatever, and search Family Search historical records. Same thing in Ancestry. If you're you click that Ancestry link, it takes all that information from the person page, pops it into the Ancestry search fields, and conducts that search for you. And then once you get into either of those places, either historical records, Ancestry, wherever, you also have the option to edit that search. So for example, when I'm in there and it grabs maybe the spouse and all the children, and I don't get very good results, then I edit my search in Ancestry or Family Search Historical Records, remove the parents and children children, maybe add a marriage if it wasn't there or whatever. The point is I can edit it, it's wonderful, and then I can rerun that search. But I love those logos over on the side because they're just a very fast way of running a search and then if I want to edit it, it's also very easy to do. Kay, great question. Thank you so much for asking that. And I'm seeing another question from Wayne. Let's see, when searching by country, do you have to be aware of historical content and boundary changes? Wayne, that is a fantastic question. That, I, the easy answer to that is yes. The harder answer is how do you become aware of that? And there is a link to that shoot, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it is a a site that Family Search does that provides all that information. So I would say if you would like that link, please email me. And I think, Braden, can I type my email in here for everybody? Will that work if I, let me try this, cheesy at gmail.com. Did that, nope, it didn't, maybe I did something wrong here, let's see. Okay, there we go. So that's my email address. If you are interested in this, what this site is, I absolutely love it. You type in a place name, and then Family Search brings up all the boundary changes, the latitude, the latitude, links to histories, all kinds of things. So Wayne brings up such a good point that having the context of a location is so helpful when you're doing your research. So if you're interested in this link, please email me, and I I will find the link and send it to you. Thank you, Wayne, for that great question. Okay, thank you very much. If there are any more questions, feel free to write those in now. Um, just a reminder, um, if you missed some of this presentation, it is being recorded and will be posted onto our website later, so you can go back and, and uh, watch them as well. Um, so yeah. there's a, let me see, there's a, No, it's, let me see, I can, we can just do this. So let us know if you can see the email a little bit better now. Um, so anyways, 
Well, yeah. uh, and Kay, oh, okay, good. She can see it. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think that's everything for today. Um, please join us tomorrow for our next webinar and for the ones in the future. Thank you very much.